Getting to level 50 in ESO is a great achievement in itself. This can take some players less than 10 hours, others it will take 30 plus. It matters not how you got to level 50 because this game has so many unique ways to play based on what kind of playstyle you like. But nonetheless, if you are here at level 50 by power leveling or by questing, it means that you have gotten through some of the most overwhelming beginner stages of the game. So congratulations, now the game begins. Hey everyone, my name is Adam and I do guides here for Bra We Got This in ESO. I mainly focus on beginner guides as most of you know, but this year I have a goal of wanting to focus a lot on the mid game of ESO. What do I consider the mid game? Well, I consider the mid game to be, or at least the beginner stages of the mid game to be levels 50 to CP 300. I believe that a lot of players really struggle in this area and that's mainly because I think that certain things in the game start becoming monotonous for some players. Uh, players don't know what they should do. Uh, they don't know how to gear up their character. And most importantly, players just don't really understand a lot of the aspects and mechanics of their builds or uh, the systems in the game. There are so many beginner guides in ESO now in this day and age, but I believe that there is a lack of guides on helping players transition from beginner to the end game. So in this guide, I'll be doing a complete mid game level 50 to CP 300 breakdown to hopefully help those of you in this situation. I will also say that this guide is not just for levels 50 to CP 300 because I believe that there are some players that are above CP 300 that can learn some useful tips from this video. I'm also going to be making more guides like this throughout the whole year that's going to be breaking down individually certain systems in the game that I think a lot of players are confused about. So please leave me a comment below letting me know what are you most confused about in the game right now. And lastly, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our patrons. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to Michael for becoming a patron again and uh, thank you just to all the patrons i really do appreciate it and if you ever want to watch me play live i stream on twitch.tv slash brawby got this on tuesday through friday i also have a second channel at brawby play this you can find that link below in the description and you can check out our discord where we have a lot of helpful players and events going on in the guild and lastly you can check out our website at brawbygotthis.com like my other complete beginner guide, I will have timestamps for this video. I do, however, highly recommend that you watch this from beginning to end because it goes in order. But if you want to check out those timestamps, they are in the description as well, and the chapters are on the screen. So the first thing we're going to talk about today in the mid game guide is champion points. You've probably noticed that when you leveled up to level 50, you started earning these champion points. Uh, up in your screen and you'll see the champion point tab right here. So here is the champion point screen. There are three different colors of champion points. There's green, which is like a crafting tree or like a non-combat tree. It does have some combat related things in it, but you're gonna find things like finding extra gold in uh, chests and safe boxes. You're gonna find uh, reduced time to take to harvest per stage. You're gonna find some mount speed stuff in here. You're gonna find just various utility things. The blue tree is the warfare tree. This is where you're going to find a lot of your damage and some mitigation and healing. You're also going to find crit as well and resources. So you have like a damage side over here that deals with like damage over time, area of effect, single target damage. You have crit and crit healing right here. And then some other little utility factors there. You've got a whole healing tree over here. And you've got a lot of mitigation for tanks over here. And then some of these are uh, like just resource boosts. The red tree is the fitness tree. This is like added effects or uh, you could call it utility slash mitigation still as well. But there's just a whole slew of different things in here. You've got like uh, health magicka, stamina recovery. You've got armor. You've got making your skills cost less. You have uh, gaining resources back for sustain. You have damage shield passives that you can get. There's a whole slew of things. But that is basically the three trees. Now, I'm gonna break this down a little bit more here in a second, but how do you actually earn these? Well, this is like the Diablo Paragon system. So if you are familiar with Diablo, then you will probably understand this pretty easily. If you're not, I'm gonna try to explain it as best I can. So how it works is you will start out on one of these colors and every level, every CP level that you go up, it will earn another color's points. So you see here, I have 14 green points uh, that I have not slotted, 46 blue ones and 126 red. You'll see that my CP level is 1339. So 
every level that you go up, it alternates and gives you a point in the colors. Say at first like 30 levels, it gives you 10 in each one, right? So then level 31 CP, you're gonna get green. 32, you're gonna get blue. 33, you're gonna get red. And then back to green, blue, red. That's how the leveling works for CP. Now, the cool thing in ESO is that your CP is shared between all of your characters. So what that means is, is if you get a character to level 50, okay, and then you grind up in your CP 600, let's say, whenever you create a character that's level 50 again, you'll automatically go to CP 600 and you can use the 600 CP points for their tree. It does not take away from the points in your other characters trees either. It's just, you get your 600 points. It's really, really nice for making alternate characters. CP also has enlightenment. So if you're not familiar with enlightenment, enlightenment is basically when like rested XP. So when you're gone from the game for a while, you'll have some enlightenment stored up and you'll be able to gain levels, um, gain ex uh, increased experience. The next thing I wanna talk about with CP is they changed this this past year. So this is fairly new, but you have these slottable stars up here. What I want you to look at is any star that is like white in the center, um and is not yellow you can probably see this it's like uh this more this is more yellow this is more blue and what you'll see is is that at the bottom it says add to champion bar to activate okay you'll not see this on this one any star that's like this you will not get its passive effect unless you put it on this bar so the four slottable bars that i have or four slottable stars that i have are fighting finesse deadly aim thaumaturge and biting aura these are going to be added to here and I will get those effects. So when you're putting points into your trees, you need to keep in mind that these yellowish ones will automatically give you that no matter what. But you cannot, if, if you're wondering like, why don't I have more, more max magicka or more spell, spell damage or more stamina? Well, it's because you have not slotted these. So you have to keep that in mind. You also have to keep in mind that in order to get to some of these trees, you have to get enough points in these trees beforehand until you can get to them. So that's something else you need to know as well. Red and green are the same way. If you do not slot your stars, you're not gonna get the passive effects in those specific ones with like the white center that says add to champion bar to activate. Champion points are something that are highly customizable. So there's nothing that I can say in this guide that's going to give you a direct uh, way of actually knowing what to slot for your build. Every build is gonna have different stars. Now, there's gonna be a lot of builds also that are sharing a lot of the same stars because there's a few stars that are just really good. But just to keep in mind, if, if this is just a general rule of thumb, if you need guidance on slotting stars, if you're a Magicka or Stamina DPS, you're gonna be slotting probably some of these stars over here. Again, these are damaging stars and crit, okay? It doesn't mean that you're not gonna slot some of these other ones or anything like that, but these are typically the stars that you're gonna be slotting, okay? If you're a healer, you're typically gonna be slotting maybe some stars in here and then some of these, cause this is like healing done with healing over time effects. This is area of effect, this is single target. So you're gonna maybe be slotting some of those. If you're a tank, you're gonna be slotting some of these stars because these are like mitigation. When it comes to the red tree, you're gonna be slotting like some of these, you're gonna slot this probably, and then maybe some of these. Uh, this is where it gets really customizable though because like tanks can slot maybe damage shield abilities or passives here. Uh, so it gets, again, very customizable. The rule of thumb that I tell people with the green tree is it's really just up to you. Uh, there's so many different little things here and you really just can put whatever you want. You can't have everything. So you have to kind of pick wisely. Now, when it comes to if you're scared that you're messing up, don't worry, okay? All you gotta do is press F to redistribute. And what that will do is it will charge you 3000 gold if you commit your changes, okay? So don't feel like you can't change things. It's not impossible to fix it. It's pretty easy. Okay, now moving on to the next section, which is the passives. Passives are important, okay? I tell people not to worry about them too much when they get to fit until they get to 50 because you need to get some of your skills first so you can actually use your skills. But passives are something that are going to just play a massive role for you in the game. Passives will give you increased uh, health, magicka, stamina, they'll give you critical, they'll give you AOE damage, like, 
There are passives for a lot of things and each class has its own unique passives. Just to give you guys some examples, again, Ardent Flame. This is uh, Dragonite. The combustion passive will increase the damage of your burning and poison side effects by 50%. That's a lot. When you apply burning to an enemy, you restore 1000 magicka. When you apply poison to an enemy, you restore 1000 stamina. These effects can occur once every 0.5 seconds. You have warmth, which when you deal direct damage with an ardent flame ability, you reduce the enemy's movement speed by 30%. Searing heat. This increases the damage of your t over time by your fiery breath, searing strike, dragon standard abilities by 33%. World in Ruin increases the damage of your flame and poison attacks by 5%. So these are just fantastic passives. Something else I want you to see is the reason a lot of times people are running 5-1-1 setup on tanks or they people want to run multiple armor setups is because you have these undaunted passives. These will give you health, magicka, and stamina based off the item set types that you are wearing. What I would recommend is if you are limited on skill points, then put your points into the passives that you need the most. So look at the person that you're following's build or the build that you're making, or if you're following one of my builds, look at the passives that we recommend first and then put those into that. And then you can use your pa other points for other passives, but passives are going to help you a lot. They might not be seen, they might not be felt, but they are going to be a massive part of the game for you. That moves us on to the skill points. I want to talk briefly about that because in order to get your passives, you have to use skill points. Okay. Why are skill points so important? Well, if you don't have them, then you can't get your passives or skills. So you need to have skill points. A lot of reasons I tell people to take their time in this game is because if people grind to CP 160, they don't have a lot of skill points because they just grinded levels. You will get a certain amount of skill points per, you know, grinding levels, but you really, really need to actually get more in order to get the things that you need. So I'm going to go through the ways that you can get skill points. First of all, questing. Questing is one of the biggest ways to get skill points. There's tons of skill points in quests. I always recommend questing. One of the other easy ways to get them is public dungeons, okay? Public dungeons have a guaranteed skill point in every single one. You just need to do the multiplayer event in the public dungeon. So these are public dungeons. You need to do the multiplayer event or the group boss event, and that will get you a guaranteed skill point. So if you want, get a group together and run public dungeons. Dungeon quests are the next thing that give you skill points okay so you'll see here it says elden hollow one elden hollow two each of those the first time you do them on your character will have a quest attached to it and will give you a guaranteed skill point point. and then one of the other ways is pvp if you're a pvp -er, or if you want to do pvp you'll get skill points through that and then the other way that is more uh, takes a little bit longer is collecting sky shards every three sky shards that you collect will give you a skill point okay so now we're going to move on to a part of the video that I think a lot of players don't understand and they have a lot of questions about. And this is something that I've learned over time as well, but it's a very valid question. And so this is actually, this next section is about a uh, skill bar, like swapping and why certain skills are put on certain uh, bars. Like why are your AOEs put on your back bar? Why are your damage abilities put on your front bar? All that good stuff. Okay. So we're going to get into that right now. So this is a this is a question that a lot of people ask or a lot of people just have, I feel like, um, and that is like understanding skill bars and why people in builds put things on certain sides of them. So you have your back bar and your front bar, obviously, right? I want you to first understand that if you lay a damage over time effect down, like if I lay this wall of elements down and if I switch bars, I want you to understand the basic concept that that wall of elements is still going on. You see the ticks, right? The ticks of damage. It is still going on. It just exploded. It is over. Okay. But what I want you to understand is say my stats are higher on my front bar. Okay. Say my crit is higher. Say my damn, my spell damage is higher. That means that when I'm on that front bar, any damage over time effect, any uh, area of effect that's causing a damage over time, whatever it is, if it is still ticking damage, it is going to tick and proc based off the stats that I have on the front bar. It is not going to tick off the stats of the back bar. So this is one of the first major reasons I think people put AOEs on the back bar because you don't spend as much time on the back bar. You'll see here on my back bar, I have a shield, 
I have a damage over time that enhances my um, flame damage. I have a ability that I use every 15 seconds that will in that will also um, give me critical damage boosts. I have a damage over time and I have a damage over time. Okay, so there would be no reason for me to stay on this back bar because that's gonna do dam. All these are doing damage over time and augmenting my skills on the front bar. On my front bar, you'll see I have a damage over time. I have a possible spammable and damage over time. I have a spammable. I have a AOE spammable, and I have an enhancement. Okay, so all of these skills for the most part are getting enhanced by like engulfing flames or barbed trap and these aoe's are getting enhanced by flames of oblivion because what flames of oblivion does is when it is slotted which slotted just means when it's on your bar i'm gaining major prophecy in major savagery increasing my spell and weapon critical rating by 2629 when i swap bars i am not getting that anymore so the reason i have it on the front bar is because it is increasing these abilities and it increases the damage ticks of these skills. So what you'll see is right now on that bar, I'm 52.7% spell critical. If I switch bars, that goes to 30.6 spell critical, okay? So there's a reason that people put their damage, their damage over times on their back bar and other utility skills, maybe pre-buff skills, like for Nightblade, maybe you'll do your pre-buff fight skills. Um, and there's a reason your executes and your spammables and your single target abilities are on your front bar because your front bar is where you're going to spend a lot of your time. Because when you rotate back to your back bar, you're going to just lay these down as quick as you can. You're going to put that down, put that down, put the flame down, put your barb trap down, and then you're going to use a shield if you need it. But the biggest reason is because, again, you're going to have the stats of your front bar. And so what people do is they stack their front bar with stats. So a lot of times you'll see people's builds, they have, you know, um, three pieces of jewelry and then they have one staff, right? That means that those three pieces of jewelry and the one staff are gonna give you the five items that you need. And you only need that, say, on your front bar. Now, this bar is obviously completely customizable, right? But this is a way to make you doing your rotation simpler and easier to perform. Because think about it. Say you had an AOE here, and then you had a the AOE spammable right here, and then you had this AOE on the back, on the front bar, it would be really confusing, right? It would make a rotation a jumbled mess. So what people have done is they've simplified it and made it organized. That's why you see you do all your stuff on your back bar first usually, and then you go to your front bar, and then you switch back really quick, do all these, switch back. That's why those are there. I feel like a lot of times people don't explain that, and I have not explained that sometimes well enough. So I hope that that does help you in that situation. Okay, so the next section I wanna talk about is something that I think that a lot of people as well don't really understand or kind of just don't grasp or ever utilize and think about. Uh, this is something that I've learned over time, over the years of playing the game, but it's something that uh, I want to help you guys with. And this is having combat awareness and knowing what to do when you are in certain fights in dungeons and trials in world, wherever you're at. So let's get into that now. So something that I want you guys to understand is whenever you're following a build video, whether it's mine or someone else's, there's going to be a rotation that they have, right? That rotation is used on trial dummies or used in the world or however they present it. But what I want you to understand is a full rotation is not what you always need to do in a fight, okay? Because you don't have time. If you're ever running dungeons, okay, and you're killing trash mobs, you don't have to do a full rotation. What you would more often do is you would lay your AOEs or dots down and then spam whatever spammable you have if it's an AOE spammable or a single target spammable. So for instance, in this stamp sork right here that you see, my normal rotation for this would be to use crit surge, hurricane, throw cow drops down, uh, bow, and then I would spam stampede or I'd use my single target wrecking blow ability if I'm fighting a boss. If I'm fighting trash mobs, okay, then I don't need to do all that because I don't have time. So what I'll do is use Hurricane, Crit Surge, and I'll throw my Caltrops down, my bow, and then I'll just Stampede, 
and spam stampede and then they're dead but if i'm over here trying to do my single target or if i'm trying to do any more pre-buffs it's not going to be quick enough so again i'll use my caltrops i won't even use my bow there and i'll stampede and kill these things right and then i'll finish that off with a single target ability so again here's another group right here i'll use my pre-buffs caltrops and then i'm just spamming stampede i'm not even i'm not even using any other ability just stampede You'll see that they get cleared. I'll use my single target for that guy, and he dies. So when I actually pull this boss, I'm gonna do my pre-fight buffs. I'm gonna lay my AOEs down, and I'm gonna do my actual full rotation, which was what that does is it only really adds one more skill, but I am still going to do the full one. So that's something that I want you guys and gals to understand because I feel like a lot of people don't understand that in mob fights or in trash fights, you're not going to use a full rotation. You're going to usually do like two or three skills. That way you can clear content and clear the mobs quicker. But in your boss fights and in longer fights, you need to do your full rotation. So please just understand that. If you have any questions about that, again, leave me a comment below. There's a lot more on combat awareness that I'm gonna go into in further guides, but it really needs its own guide because I want to talk about very specific things when it comes to combat cues, when it comes to uh, knowing when to block, all that stuff, right? So I'm gonna go into that in later guides here in the channel. So if you don't wanna miss that, make sure to ring that bell icon so you get notifications here when I release videos and make sure to just like, subscribe as well. It really helps out the channel. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into one of the biggest sections here in the guide and this is gearing up and progression this is where a lot of players really struggle i think as well in this phase of the game so i want to help all of you out here now again this section might be the one that most of you are kind of struggling with i want to try to simplify this for you if you are under cp 160 don't worry so much about what uh, set you are wearing with your armor okay but try your best to get the weight of armor you're going to be using in your build equipped and leveled up. That's what I want you to focus on the most. So if you have a friend or if you've picked up some dungeon armor or had a set crafted from you, for you for, from your friend, just make sure that that is your uh, correct armor weight. You'll see here your armor lines. You have light armor for magicka DPS and healer. You need to have medium armor for your stamina DPS characters and then heavy armor for your tank. Make sure that these lines are getting leveled up. My main goal for you by CP160 is to have your main armor line leveled to 50. So again, you're going to level out of every armor set that you get on your way to CP160. You're just going to, you're gonna level out of it. So find an armor set, you know, at CP30 or 40 and just kind of stick with that until CP160, but just make sure that you're, you have enough pieces of your light medium and heavy to level it up to 50 by the time you get to cp 160 because what that will do is it'll allow you to have all your passives ready if you have the skill points and these passives are important for the builds that you're going to be using so again that is a high priority now once you hit cp 160 gear will drop at that level forever so now you can start building your first intro beginner in-game build. Some builds utilize armor sets that you can obtain at level CP 160. And so if that is your build, then you are in luck early on. But if that is not your build, don't worry. There are tons of item sets to use in this game. The main thing that you need to do is just get two full sets to get you started. Because more importantly, you need to learn your build rotation and how your build works more than getting your sets. I'm going to give you a couple sets that you can go for that are easy and obtainable at CP 160 for all roles. For Magicka DPS, some sets include Mother Sorrow, Burning Spellweave, Overwhelming Surge, and Julianos. Mother Sorrow is farmable in the Deshaun Overland zone. That is a base game zone. It's very, very easy to get. Burning Spellweave is farmable in all the City of Ash dungeons. You can do this on normal. You do not have to do this on vet. Overwhelming Surge is farmable on Tempest Island dungeon on normal base game dungeon. And Julianos is in the Rothgar zone. It is a craftable set. You need six traits to craft it or you can get someone to craft it for you. Now for stamina DPSs, you can use Briarheart, Leviathan, Venomous, and Hunting's Rage. 
Briarheart is farmable in the Rothgar Overland Zone and is a very good set for stamina DPSs. Leviathan is in Crypt of Hearts base game dungeon. You can do this on normal as well. You could also use this for Magicka if you want, but you might as well just use it for um, stamina because it gives you extra max stamina with that two item set bonus. Venomous is farmable in Western Skyrim, and this is something that I like to use a lot of the time on my stamina characters to start out. This is an Overland set. And Hunting's Rage is a craftable set in the base game zones. You can do this in every single alliance. The one that is in the Aldermary Dominion is in Reaper's March. It takes six traits to craft this one. Now for healers, you can get Winter's Respite, which is farmable in the Western Skyrim zone. It's an Overland set. It's a very good healer beginner set. You can get Sanctuary by doing the Banished Cells dungeons on normal. You can get Worm's Raiment, which is in the Vaults of Madness base game dungeon on normal. And one of the best healer sets that's in a lot of in-game healer builds is farmable from a free dungeon now. Uh, it's a DLC dungeon, but you can do it on normal at level 45, but I would do it at CP 160, is Spell Power Cure. This is in the White Gold Tower. Just do it on normal. It is very, very simple on normal. This is a great healer set. Now for tank, there are sets like Ebon Armory, which is in the Crypt of Hearts base game dungeon. You can farm this on normal. You can also get Winter's Respite as well as a tank because this will heal your group members and you're going to be laying down some things that will proc this. So this is also a great beginner set in my opinion for tanks. Uh, you just need to do the jewelry and weapons so you don't get the light armor debuffs in my opinion. Um, another great set for tanks are Imperium, which is again in the White Gold Tower. Uh, this is a dungeon that everyone can do now, and this is just a great, great starter set for tanks, and it's really good in the end game in my opinion as well. And then the last set that I want to recommend is a crafted set, which is in uh, Grotwood. This is in other zones as well, but this is uh, in the base game. This is Torog's Pact. This is going to only take three traits research to make, or you can get someone to craft it as well. Now, please keep in mind that these are not all the armor sets that you can use as a tank healer, stamina DPS, or magic DPS. These are just four sets that I think are very easily obtainable and that anyone can do at CP 160, and that will get you started and off the ground to get you towards uh, doing dungeons and trials and all that stuff like that. Obviously, you're going to have to do some of these dungeons before you get the set, but that's fine. You're going to be okay. If you do them on normal, it will be perfectly fine. Now, the next tip for gearing and progression is going to be upgrading your armor and when to upgrade and what to upgrade. The thing that I would recommend is if you were CP160 and you were getting gear, okay, you can upgrade your armor to purple and your weapons to purple if, you, if they're starting out on blue. I would keep your jewelry at blue. Now, as you level up and as you keep playing with the sets that you're playing with, if you find that this is the build that you want to stick with for the end game, then you can start upgrading other things. Okay, the first thing I would upgrade from purple is your weapons. Your weapons, you can do this first. I would not recommend doing the armor or jewelry first. Next, you really don't need gold armor, but if you want to min max, then you can then upgrade your armor from purple to gold. I think that upgrading your jewelry from blue to purple is obviously fine, uh, and you really, really, really need to make sure that if you want to upgrade your jewelry from purple to gold, that you are going to have this build for a while, because upgrading jewelry to gold is extraordinarily expensive, and it's honestly just not worth it, in my opinion. If you want to min-max to the your heart's content, then upgrading jewelry to gold is the last thing I would do. So max on jewelry I would do is purple, but I would always upgrade your weapons to gold when you figure out if that is what you want. Don't upgrade your weapon to gold if it's going to be an item set that you use for 50 levels. Do not do that. If it's a, if it's a build that you're going to keep using, upgrade your weapons to gold, then do your armor, and then jewelry is a last last effort thing. Now, when it comes to what activities you should be doing in levels 50 to 300 CP, there are a lot of options. You can first off, always quest. They will get you skill points and it's just a relaxing thing and fun thing to do. But now I'm gonna go into the three activities that you can do while getting to CP 300 or beyond. And I'm going to go in depth on each of these. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is dungeons. Dungeons are some of the core things that you can do in the end game and they make up a lot of ESO's PVE. I love the dungeons in this game. I think that they're very unique and they're fun and challenging, especially when you get into the vet levels. If you look here in the dungeon 
uh, group finder, you can go here and go to specific and these are all the dungeons that you can do. Now what you'll notice is there are two versions. There are veteran dungeons and normal dungeons. Obviously normal dungeons are uh, easier and veteran dungeons are more challenging. Now again, each dungeon uh, has a quest in it and uh, there are base game dungeons and DLC dungeons. The DLC dungeons unlock at level 45. What I would recommend is that you do all normal dungeons at CP 160 and you continue doing that until you get an armor set and, and a build, a beginner build that you can use, okay? I would not recommend going into a veteran dungeon with an incomplete build. So until you get your build ready, do normal dungeons, okay? Now, before I get into what the differences between normal and veteran is, I want to tell you about the Undaunted. At level 45, you'll un you unlock the Undaunted Enclaves, okay, and the ability to do pledges. What pledges are, are these daily quests that you see above these people's heads right here. Each alliance has an Undaunted Enclave. For Aldermere Dominion, you need to go to uh, Grotwood, Elden Root, and it is this symbol right here. When you're in the Daggerfall Covenant, you'll need to go to Stormhaven, Go to Wayrest, and it's right here. If you are in the uh, Ebonheart Pact, you need to go to Deshaun, go to Mournhold, and go right here. So what these pledge givers do, each pledge giver has a set of dungeons they will assign you. So this person will assign base game dungeons, this person will assign base game dungeons, but they have specific ones that they will assign, and then this person will do DLC dungeons, okay? What these daily quests give you is they give you undaunted keys and experience and some other rewards as well. But the important part of it is the undaunted keys, okay? What undaunted keys are used for are they are used to buy these coffers. What are in these coffers are two one of the two-piece monster sets that you can obtain in the game for those specific dungeons. So you'll see here, the Banished Cells coffer gives either the Shadow Rend shoulders or the Maw of the Infernal shoulders. Please note that these coffers only drop shoulders. They do not drop the helmet. We will talk about how you get the helmet in a second. But you'll see that each of these are themed per dungeon. So if you want the crag set shoulders, do not open the Darkshade Caverns coffer. You'll need to buy the Fungal Grotto coffer. These are five undaunted keys a piece. The same is true over here to this pledge giver and this DLC giver. Whatever pledges they, that they give, they'll have the coffers for. Now, in order to get the keys, you need to complete those quests. If you do a normal dungeon pledge, you will get one key for doing it. So if you do all three on this character, you'll get three keys, and then you can do it on all your characters that are at least, C, uh, that are at least level 45. If you wanna get more keys, then what you can do is you can do the dungeon on veteran hard mode, okay? When you do a pledge on veteran hard mode, you will get two keys for the pledge. Now, veteran hard mode is activated at the final boss of a dungeon by reading a scroll, usually. Now, sometimes final dungeon bosses that have hard modes have certain parameters that you need to do as well. Um, and that is how you activate that hard mode. But most dungeons in the game will have a scroll that you read at the end and that will that, that will activate the hard mode for you. Let's talk about the difference between normal and veteran dungeons. Normal dungeons, again, are a lot easier. And the main thing that I want you to understand with normal dungeons are anyone can do these, okay? Anyone can do these, and they drop armor and jewelry at blue quality, okay? That is one of the biggest takeaways from it. So you get blue quality from them, not purple. Veteran dungeons, they're gonna be harder, uh, and they are going to drop armor and jewelry at purple quality, not blue quality. I recommend that you do veteran dungeons again once you have a beginner uh, set and build ready. Now, when it comes to DLC vet dungeons, I would not recommend doing these at least until you get to CPU 300 because these are extremely harder than the base game dungeon. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is monster sets. I told you that you can get these shoulders from these pledge givers. Now, how do you get the helmets? In order to get the headpieces for the two-piece monster sets, you just need to do the corresponding dungeon on veteran. When you complete the corresponding dungeon on veteran, the final boss will drop a guaranteed monster helm. It will either be a light, medium, or heavy helm. So if you're looking for the heavy, you're gonna have to keep farming it until you get it. 
The last thing I want to talk to you about dungeons are just the dungeon finder. So you can do your daily dungeon each day. That's a random. That will give you bonus XP. It will give you premium undaunted exploration supplies. Make sure to do your randoms every day because you'll need that XP. And you'll also get some good resources from the uh, exploration supplies. Now you can still run randoms after that. It's just not as much XP for it. The next type of content that I want to talk about are trials. These are the raids of ESO and these are 12 man events or uh, instances. Trials look like this symbol right here with the little plus and the little like horns above it. And the same thing goes with trials. There are normal and there are veteran trials. Vet trials are the end of all end game in ESO in my opinion. Now there are base game trials that are a little bit easier on vet obviously than some of the DLC or expansion trials, but there are normal and vet and that's something I want you to understand. Again, when you do a normal trial, you will get blue quality items uh, and when you do vet, you will get higher quality. Uh, this is the biggest thing I want you to understand with trials. So many players are afraid to enter trials. They're afraid to do them and they think that they can't do them at CP160. What I want you to understand is there are a lot of sets in trials that are used for builds. Um, and there's a lot of sets that um, you can obtain pretty easily in the trials. We do trials every Tuesday night uh, in my guild on stream. So if you want to join those on PCNA, join our discord and come and join those trials. But what I want you to understand is that we carried someone that was CP 90 through a trial. I don't usually recommend people doing that because I want to give people that are at least CP 160 a chance. We did cloud rest. We did Sunspire, and we did, um, kinds ages with that person. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that in normal trials, you don't need to have everything together to run them. You can run trials at CP160. Now, there's a caveat to that statement with a few trials. I would say that the only normal um, trials that you really should have a full team, at least CP160, and have uh, sets and everything for are um, the Law Maw of Lorcage trial. Um, I do not recommend doing this trial unless you have a good, a decent team for that. Uh, it's still pretty difficult on normal. And the Rock Grove trial, I think that is one that you need to have a decent compatibility in your team uh, to be able to complete. The Rock Grove trial is in Blackwood. That is the newest trial that was added to the game. So that is the one caveat I would say with that. But all other trials in the game, you can do at CP160. You, and you're most likely not gonna have a full team of CP160. You're gonna have people that are 800 CP, 1000 CP. So please keep that in mind. The other thing that I want you to understand is just don't be afraid to join them. Don't be afraid to join trials, okay? Again, even if you don't have a full build yet, don't be afraid to join the trial. I would still recommend that you try to have a beginner build, like built out, but if you don't, there's definitely people that will run you through trials. In trials though, there are eight DPS, two healers, and two tanks usually. And again, they really aren't as bad as people think. I think people are just nervous to break out of that shell, but don't be. There are people that will do this with you. And if you ever want to find a random group, go to Craglorn and go to Belkarth and just type in the zone chat looking for certain trial. The last of the activities that I want to talk about that you can do as as a mid game player as you're going from 50 to 300 CP are daily quests. Daily quests are found in all DLC or expansion zones. Okay, uh, these will have blue icons above them. And what the quest will usually have you do is it will have you kill world bosses, um, have you kill bosses and delves and do things in delves and in other various activities like public incursions and other things like that. Some dailies require uh, prerequisites before you can do them or unlock them, but a lot of them are already unlocked as soon as you get into the zone. Daily quests are very fun because you can get cosmetics like motifs um, that are in all your outfit styles right here. Uh, you can get, you can sell those for money. You can sell furniture recipes for money, and you can get a uh, set zone zone set items from them as well. I personally love doing daily quests because they just are a nice break from the game. Uh, questing and from doing dungeons and trials. You can also share your daily quests. So if you have a daily quest, you can press F to share it and your group members will get it and you can do them multiple, you can do multiple daily quests in a zone 
per character. So I know some of you are probably gonna have some questions. And so if you do, please leave me a comment below, come by my Twitch chat and ask me questions there as well, Tuesday through Friday, like I said. Uh, I'd love to help you out in this journey from going from 50 to 300 CP. And like I said, I'm gonna be making a lot more mid game guides this year in the channel. So uh, they're gonna be on specific things I talked about in this video and then other things and other questions that people had. So that way people that are going through this phase of the game will hopefully uh, be able to uh, have a direction like I said. So make sure to ring that bell like I said before. Uh, that will help you have the notifications on so when I post a video you'll know what it is and you can come and watch it. And again you can check out all my social links below on Twitter. You can check out my Discord, my website, my second channel, and our podcast that we have. Check out my other guides here as well. They'll be here on the cards on the screen. There'll be some in the description and just in my channel in general. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you for watching. And until next time, y'all just remember, have faith, be great, and I'll see you on ESO.